All right, guys, should we, uh, should we begin to start uh, with introductions, Greg? Sure. I, I mean, I'll go first. Um, I'm Greg. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm one of the principals at K4 Capital. We are an early stage venture capital firm that invests in uh, technology companies that close gaps of access, opportunity, and outcome for low-income communities and communities of color in the United States. Great. I'll go next. I'm Naira Jordan. I'm with uh, the American Family Insurance Institute for Corporate and Social Impact. I'm one of the community and social impact investment directors. And we invest in seed and Serie A's tech companies that align to healthy youth development, equity and education, climate and community resilience, and economic empowerment and justice reform. Thanks for having me here today. So hi, everybody. Eric Chapman. I'm a managing principal at Sustained VC. Uh, we've been doing early stage impact investing since 2007, uh, have something on the order of 43 companies in our portfolio. All of them uh, have some kind of a social or environmental impact baked into the business model. So as the business scales and grows, the impact scales and grows and can't be stripped out later if they get acquired or a different ownership uh, structure takes over. And uh, yeah, very pleased to be here today. Um, we focus similar to my colleagues on Series Seed, Series A. Chris. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chris Bentley. I'm a seed and early stage impact investor. I, I uh, actually started off working with Sustain VC and the in the in Eric's team and then uh, went to work with Josh Melman at Serious Change Investments. And uh, you know, most recently decided to really focus in on a theory of impact around uh, uh, addressing issues related to the criminal justice system. So uh, last year, I launched uh, the Incarceration Fund, which is a seed and early stage uh, impact fund that's um, looking to capitalize on, I, I think, what's an important but overlooked opportunity, which is scalable enterprises that are working to eliminate suffering caused by the criminal justice system. And so we invest in businesses that are returning power and agency to individuals that have had it systemically taken away. And... Uh, um, We'll talk a little bit about some examples of those uh, investments and, and how we're moving forward. So just to, to level set the discussion today, we're sort of going to touch on uh, four different topics here. Uh, Greg's going to start us out by you know, giving us a sort of level set of, uh, of some of the unjustness that exists in this, in this space. And now he's going to talk about some really important ecosystem development work that's going on. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, policy and how policy impacts the impact investment space. And then Eric's going to jump into uh, some private sector solutions, and we'll all talk a little bit about examples there. Uh, I think we're going to try our best to answer questions sort of as they go, if we see things that we can hit on in the in the chat room, and we're all going to sort of you know, sort of manage each of these like little mini panels. So we'll we'll all chime in a little bit after each person started and do our best to work our way through it. So I guess with all that context, I'll, I'll pass it up to Greg and then we can start. Thanks. Yeah, and feel free to jump in on mine. Uh, I tend to ramble. So uh, put, the, put the bumper bowling uh, bumpers in. Um, so when I think about what impact is and kind of especially in, as it relates to justice, I think that there's an important uh, distinction that should be made between what impact investors can do in, in, in our role. Um, the way that I look at kind of these big problems that uh, we have in our world, society, pick your poison, um, there's kind of two arenas. There's market land and there's what I call structure land and structure land is just like government and law and kind of all, all the stuff that is really hard to change. That's been, you know, a collective governance or collective action for hundreds of years um, that is typically enduring. And then the other side is market land where it's, you know, if you take well, well uh, structured, well intentioned, you know, intelligent capital and apply it to a market land solution, um, things can change. And that's great. Uh, when we're talking about justice, however, most of justice, Liz, most of the issues in justice in the justice sector and our carceral state and people getting locked up too, too often and, and uh, racial uh, issues in there, in there 
um, that are obviously plaguing has been have been plaguing us for hundreds of years, um, et cetera, et cetera. That most of that lives in structure land, and so there's a the the tools of market land are uh, not always uh, the most. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, impactful is the wrong word, <laughs> but it, it but it can feel that way certainly. Um, and so that's just one kind of big differentiate or kind of one differentiation I wanted to make. Uh, in, in, you know, as we talk about this today, is there's certain things that you know policy um, and uh, collective action, organizing, government, you know, legal lobbying, et cetera, et cetera, can help solve. And a lot of the big structural issues in our justice system, I think, are better served. Uh, uh, being uh, addressed uh, in that arena versus, you know, an app that'll help someone do something. Um, but there are things that in the, in the margins, in the periphery, sometimes right in the middle uh, where market land can have a uh, outsized impact. So just want to say that I think that it's important to, 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 to acknowledge that. Um, it's it typically gets crazier in regulated industries and justice is literally the application of, you know, state force. Um, so, uh, I just want to acknowledge that as we go forward and, and, and um, just let everyone know that's kind of how we think about it. Yeah. I'll chime in and say kind of similarly at the Institute, we think about it that way as well. I, we didn't, dis- didn't necessarily define it in those terms that you used, but I love that how you uh, spoke about that because I think it uh, it is a great illustration of that. And so we, you know, do the investment side to your point of there there are apps and there are platforms out there that can help make life easier and you know solve certain issues, but but we also are bigger things. And so for us, we kind of function across both of those. So recognizing that there is power and influence with corporations stepping into these spaces. So we try to see where we can also help move the needle on that structural or systemic side as well. So raising awareness to issues like in our own state, Wisconsin, where American family insurance is domiciled. Um, We have some pretty strict expungement laws. And so we've come out um, for a a bill that's on our Senate uh, right now that was coming before actually earlier in the summer. And we came out in the press and publicly on record to say that we felt that this new bill was something that was important. So we feel like we have this responsibility on both sides, recognizing that there's just more than one way to engage um, in this, as well as our own internal house cleaning that we're doing in terms of looking at our, some of our policies and practices. Yeah, I, I, I can add in, into that as well as sort of the, you know, we, we also are all very uh, keenly aware of some of the damage that has been caused by the private sector in this space. And so, you know, it's really important that, that you know, as we look at these opportunities, you know, we think about that and we think about, uh, you know, what the companies that we're investing in are really doing and our incentives aligned and, and so forth. So we'll, we'll certainly jump into that and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, helpful to understand, you know, the sort of broad uh, reach of, of uh, outcomes in this space. You know, there's the, there's the more than 2 million uh, individuals that are incarcerated, but there's the more than 6 million people that are under supervision. And there's the more than 10 million children who have uh, uh, one or more parents that have been affected by incarceration. And so it's, it's extremely wide reaching with, uh, with it, it extremely, you know, painful outcomes associated with it. So maybe that's a maybe that's actually a really uh, a, a smart way to transition into some of the stuff that, that that's going on in the space. And maybe maybe Naira uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, something that she's been working on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll share a little bit about how we we you know, as we started to launch into this space. So Institute opened in 2018, um, where we really started to dive into um, what we were calling at that time, this issue around mass incarceration. And we didn't have the words around justice tech um, when we started looking for companies to invest in. And what we did was we, you know, we started going through tools like PitchBook and working through our network and um, looking for companies that we felt were going to help 
uh, reduce recidivism and reduces impacts on individuals and communities. And so really broadly defining that. And as we were going through this process and trying to find all of these um, possible investment opportunities that fit within that space, what we came to discover through um, our networks and going to events, we ran into uh, folks from Village Capital and found out they were doing similar. They were also trying to define this space and gain better understanding of it. So last September, Village Capital and the Institute, uh, we convened a summit. We worked together and brought a group of individuals that are connected to the space to think about how do we define this? Because we were defining it a certain way and looking for um, opportunities. They were defining it a certain way. And so we thought, let's figure out how we can move forward and really redefining criminal and civil justice tech from a ethical, human-centered perspective. Because I think to some of the things Greg alluded to, we were both struggling, both entities were struggling with different aspects of the platforms and the, the tools that we were seeing. So this summit just really offered a chance for us to listen to our Justice Tech Advisory Board, which was a group of experts and individuals with a strong perspective on technology and the justice system. And so uh, in this, this past spring, we were able to reduce our produce and release a justice tech market assessment that was largely informed and inspired by that summit, as well as an additional 150 hours of interviews and meetings with advisory board members, as well as entrepreneurs that are operating in this space. Um, and one of the key findings from the report was that kind of what we were discovering in our in our you know research was that many of these justice tech startups fall across a variety of tech verticals and we were truly looking to define justice tech as that tech that enables that support for individuals and families as well as experts and technicians that are working within the justice tech space and in the criminal justice and civil civil justice industry but with that human centered lens on it um, and in doing that we found that financial health future of work government tech, um, healthcare, communications tech, and legal tech were all these sectors that were fragmented across this market. And so when we released that, uh, after releasing that market assessment, we thought one of the other outcomes of this was entrepreneurs saying, we want access to capital. And many um, investors aren't familiar with this space. And many investors are leery of investing in particularly founders that have a lived experience of incarceration. And so we have been working now to build an investor coalition in this space to begin engaging others that have influence and capital to make change. And so we had our first convening just last week. And I think as um, we've already started to talk about even here, what we talked about last week was our biggest challenge is to discern between ethical tech and tech that could pretty much exacerbate these systemic disparities that we see in the justice system. Um, because we've also learned, seen and heard about those technologies that um, are disrupting the system, but are not disrupting it in a way that is ethical. And so we want to make sure that we're helping move the needle forward. So thinking about the value propositions of these products, are they uh, providing meaningful improvement to the lives of justice involved individuals and their families? Thinking about what does it mean to successfully scale these solutions? Is it tied to the reduction rather than the expand, expansion of the number of justice involved individuals? And then finally, is it a company that has, you know, when, if it has that exit, what does that look like? Um, and how does it infect justice involved involve people? Um, and so that's just kind of how we've been trying to really start to build this coalition around this, this concept and really get others in the room and everybody in the room that cares about this space as, as well as those impacted by this space to start to have these conversations instead of us having these in our silos. So I'd welcome any other perspectives and thoughts on this. I'm gonna jump in for a second I, because uh, I just put the, the what I hope is the correct link in the chat there. Yeah, and I can I have a visual prop. Look, so it's Look right, at that. Well I, doodled on, I admit I doodled on That's it great. a little bit, but it's actually, you know, it's a really pretty detailed report and I found it to be fascinating reading. And all of my uh, colleagues here on screen have put a lot of time into this. And I think it's excellent. Uh, we, we focus on this area, but not uh, to the same extent that you all do. So I found it to be a really exceptionally uh, comprehensive view on the space. And I would simply encourage those in the audience to, to follow the link, get the report, read it. It's really exceptional, I think. One of the things that struck me um, as we began, and we, we've made three investments in this space, uh, but one of the th we, we really struggle with a couple of things. One you just touched on, which is this question of is it are, 
will this company be ethical today? And will it stay ethical tomorrow? Or is there a risk that somehow there are unintended consequences either with the current or perhaps even a future management team? So this is quite a, quite a challenging thing to discuss and to work your way through. Uh, the other is that the, the criminal justice system is incredibly fragmented because you go up through, you know, local, county, state, federal, all the different agencies, and there's a tremendous number of people in the system, but they're often in very different disparate systems. So you really have to chip away at it in a lot of different, uh, from a lot of different angles. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later, and I know we'll profile how our companies uh, in our portfolio do that. But I think I just thought that was worth mentioning. I thought the report does a very good job of pointing that out. Um, so we have a question in chat. Can you just share more about the group you just mentioned? Uh, is that open to others? Yeah. Do you want to maybe say, I put the link in, but it might not be the right one. Maybe you should say a little more. No, absolutely. It is open to other investors that are interested in learning more about the sector. It is, um, we have representatives for, I mean, Chris, has been a part of it. I think Greg has attended some of our sessions that we've had in the past. Um, we have um, representation from Defy Ventures um, that is um, you know, looking to expand their role in this space. They've already done some incredible work, but other investors that are really, really wanting to think about how we can start to change this space. So if you're an investor and this is a space that's of interest to you and you're looking to learn more, absolutely reach out to me. Um, reach out to me on LinkedIn, Naira Jordan, and would be happy to connect you. We have, like I said, had one last week. We have two more uh, scheduled for this year. Yeah, I'd, and I'd like to say like a really important thing uh, that is happening, you know, the, the, the broader advisory board, not just the, 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 the investment subgroup, you know, included investors, entrepreneurs, nonprofit leaders, policy advisors, but also, you know, fully 50%, maybe more than 50%, uh, you know, had direct lived experience in the criminal justice system. And I think, you know, an important recurring theme in this work to, to, to do this work well is to incorporate the voice of returning citizens in these kinds of solutions and discussions. And it's, it's part of the design of the, uh, uh, of the, the Justice Tech Group is part of the design of the the decarceration fund, and and and, and truly uh, uh, a number of the really innovative solutions are coming from returning citizens as well. So we we're we're investing in returning citizen founders uh, as well. I think now we're going to talk about one of those when we get to that that part of the discussion. But I think Chris, your your point, and I'd be interested to see what Greg and Iris view is. But the fact that um, as investors, we always look for somehow lived experience, experience with the problem. Do you really understand the problem set to use sort of the generic language of venture capital? Uh, but in this space particularly, I think we have the ability to um, incorporate a tremendous number of impacts in doing this, especially if we focus on investing in people who have lived experience, who in many cases are just disproportionately affected by these systems. Right. And at the same time, it's actually just a good business policy. Uh, and the converse is also true. I think all of us could probably tell stories and we probably want to refrain from doing that about <laughs> companies we've looked at who have great ideas, but very arm's length experience with what they're trying to work on. So well-intentioned, but actually not direct experience. So I think you're right. Having the, having the returning citizens voice and other participants voice is really critical. I don't know, Greg or Naira, if you want to comment on that further, but no, I, I would say I, I agree totally with that statement, but I think the fact that, you know, when we talk about the economic piece of it as well, it's very intentional that our space is economic empowerment and justice reform, um, because that does, uh, for us, put out that intention that there are challenges with individuals that do have that lived experiences, and oftentimes... Uh, starting their own business based off of the solutions that they know because they have been a part of this system is the option and is the, the most optimal option. And so that is very important for us to make sure that we are providing that economic opportunity for these individuals. And it's through our hiring, but it's also through supporting their startups and providing that capital. And in some cases, it's at really, really early stage, which is why we do have that other side of the work that we do, because they may not be ready for the equity investment from our institute fund side, but 
We also want to support accelerators in that idea stage to help them become a part of that pipeline so that investment and, and they can get to that seed uh, stage to get in front of those investors that are looking for that as well. Yeah, I mean, we talk about it at Kpor in in, uh, in terms of lived experience of the problem. We also use a term called distance traveled. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you know all our justice investments have to be formerly incarcerated individuals. There's more than enough suffering that our incarceral system has put onto entire communities in this country, uh, and lots of those entrepreneurs are also working to. Um, or, or from those backgrounds are working to undo some of that injustice and th it doesn't necessarily need to be them who's had to deal with it directly. It could have been a parent or a brother or sister or a child or whatever, maybe. Um, unfortunately, the big, you know, with the incarceration rates as they are, uh, a lot of people know someone who's been locked up. So we think that we, we're not, uh, what's the word, ideological about this by any stretch? Um, but we do think that it's important for founders to have, you know, a real stake in the outcome if they're, if they're correct and successful. Yeah. And, and, and in cases where we don't see that uh, experience on the management team, uh, you know, we'll often also encourage uh, the management team to, to, to actively begin to recruit from that space too. I mean, there's a lot of great Nonprofit groups is a group called Televerde, which is uh, working with a couple of women's prisons that's that's training on business development in the tech industry, and they are uh, uh, getting women trained up and prepared and placed in 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 great roles at you know companies like Salesforce and Adobe and, and large tech companies. But you know, encouraging our tech companies to be looking to that same you know pool to recruit business development folks, and there's other great uh, nonprofits doing the same work on engineering and coding as well. So there's lots of opportunities uh, to find some great resources here and add that, you know, piece of the experience to the, to the team. So I think that's something else I, I would encourage, in, you know, when investing in this space to look for opportunities to, to build that experience in if it's not, you know, organic in the, in the founders. Let me, um, I want to, I don't want an awkward pause while I'm trying to read this, uh, next, <laughs> next question. So while some, someone else from the team checks that out, uh, I'll start into the next, uh, section anyways, and then, uh, we'll go from there. So I want to sort of detail a little bit more into some of what, what, uh, Greg and Eric, uh, touched on, which is, you know, sort of on the structure side, on the policy side, um, uh, it, it is a sort of uh, uh, hyper local issue. And so, you know, an important aspect of criminal justice reform is better policy. And, and many may even make the argument that, you know, our resources would be better spent advocating for better policy rather than looking for, you know, sort of market, you know, based solutions to problems. And um, while better policy uh, could greatly improve the, 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 the system. And, and we certainly spend a fair amount of time all advocating for, for better policy in this space. It's slow moving, but it's also, it, it's super local, right? So uh, most laws that can really have a m significant impact on criminal justice reform need to be changed state by state and even county by county. Um, but, you know, a, a, as an example, um, uh, if we take cash bail as an example, um, you know, this is a system that, that incarcerates individuals that have not yet been convicted of a crime based on, you know, how much money they have in their bank account, right, um, at, 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 at its root. And, and, you know, there has been public support for the elimination of cash bail in a lot of places and, and states and, and large cities have moved to eliminate cash bail. Uh, which is which is progress, but but literally at the exact same time, there are states passing legislation that actually makes it easier to uh, implement cash bail and actually eliminates the opportunity for nonprofits to step in and help with cash bail. And so, it, I bring that up as as an issue of it's a, there's there's a little bit of a sort of whack-a-mole process in trying to use policy alone to to solve these problems and. And sometimes we can find really innovative solutions 
that actually amplify good policy and make it, you know, make good policy more effective. And sometimes we can find innovative solutions that actually can, you know, really disrupt bad policy and make bad policy ineffective. And so, you know, those are, you know, a subset of the kinds of things that, that we think about, um, uh, you know, when, when, when looking at, at policy as a whole. Yeah, it's, it's like, this is one of the parts of our work at K4 that I think we don't really talk much about, but when you're investing in these types of, you know, structure land industries um, or heavy structure industries, um, understanding where the policy winds are blowing and understanding how, whether you're as an entrepreneur or as a, um, I guess an intermediary where, where you can, you know, put, put a little bit of extra oomph behind it um uh has we've seen some really good successes with that uh actually it's a whole new way of trying to affect change for sure uh, but if you are if you have the solution for let's say you know parole monitoring and it's actually you know a a uh, a, a decent human one uh and not a dehumanizing one um getting written in is the standard in your state you know, is not only important uh, for longevity of the company, but also important for maintaining um, that solution as a long-term, you know, boon to society. Um, and, for, and, and justice is one of those few industries where it's like you, if you're not playing that game, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice um, because everyone else is. Uh, and it, so it's kind of like learning the rules of how to, uh, influence and change these types of things. It's a long game. I feel like it takes a long time. You, you've got to, uh, it's a, it's a separate business, I think also in some ways. Um, but if you want that really kind of enduring piece, um, I think policy has to be a part of it. This isn't Peter Thiel, uh, you know, the government should be an algorithm type thing. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and I'll build on that slightly because I think there's a very interesting overlap between, you know, as you as you uh, coined it, market land and structure land. So there's a lot of uh, businesses that have been able to affect policy and write in the requirements for their particular product or service that make it very difficult for new entrants to come in and disrupt those markets because their statutes written as to what the product or service has to be able to do or cannot do. And this is a classic GovTech way of actually creating a monopoly situation where one hadn't existed before. And so this is an interesting overlap of, of as you describe it, policy and the free market solution. And so it, it does take time to change that, but that is one of the routes to disruptive change. And part of the challenge is for entrepreneurs to identify, uh, ideally before they start an idea, how uh, quickly and to what degree can they change that? How cost intensive is that going to be? How time intensive? And how much impact will that unlock? And also how much market potential will that unlock? Uh, but in the end, you know, underneath all of that, the common denominator is lives affected, right? And so this is really a fight worth fighting. Uh, and I think that's a lot of us take, you know, a longer view for this particular space because the speed at which change occurs is slower. Um, but that's an important factor also, I think, for us to all consider and the audience to, to know and understand. Um, so you're right, there's not going to be an algorithm that comes in and suddenly makes sweeping change. It'd be great if that would happen, but unlikely. Uh, but it can be chipped away at. Chris, should we shift to a little bit on our companies? I think that might be of great interest at this point with 15 minutes left. Yeah, that's actually, I was going to say that and I, I realized I was on mute, but this might be a good, that may be a great opportunity to switch into, uh, you know, are there really private solutions out there that, that, that actually exist today? Yeah. So I'll moderate this section a little bit. I think, Greg, first you're going to go with Promise, Chris, Adobo, uh, Nira, Pigeonly, and then I'll wrap up if we have time left with Reconnect. But these are, I think, four pretty interesting companies who touch in different spaces and Interestingly enough, among this group, we actually have a lot of overlap in some of our investments, too, which is nice to see. Uh, so let's kick it off. Yeah, sure. I'll start with Promise. So this, the, to Naira's point earlier about how uh, these types of solutions don't always look like just, uh, just uh, uh, justice tech. There's no one justice tech. There's no you know monolith. 
of what these types of companies can be. I think Promise is a good example of this. Um, Promise was started by a wonderful woman named uh, Phaedra Ellis Lampkins, uh, who t- uh, piece of piece of uh, uh, factoid. Uh, she was actually Prince's manager at one point. Um, she's she's awesome, um, and she just, she really wanted to figure out how do we get the goal of the company is how do we get poor people to not go to jail because her view is that the poor are disproportionately targeted by the justice system and that's wrong. And so when they started, um, they uh, were originally a, uh, they they were trying to take on cash bail and they were actually like paying people's cash bail and then being and having people being released into promises. uh, I guess like recognizance. I don't know what the word is. Um, and that was not scalable. <laughs> um, the justice departments were not a fan of that. Uh, it, it, there's all sorts of liability issues with that. Um, and so they took a pretty big pivot and they said, all right, well, if our goal is to stop poor people from going to jail, what is something else that we can do? And so they, lo- they basically looked at how poor people end up in jail and one of the first kind of interactions with the state in a negative way, typically, is uh, failure to pay a utility bill or failure to pay a ticket or something like that. Um, and a lot of those systems uh, that, that manage those payment systems um, are from the 80s or the 90s. Uh, they're very clunky. Uh, they're not meant to be easily used. And there's not really a reason why they're that way. Um, additionally, a lot of the, uh, uh, government agencies and, um, and, uh, municipalities and all these folks are, t- you know, on paper, very willing to do, uh, flexible payments for their constituents. Uh, but for years they just hid behind, oh, well, the, the software doesn't do that. So promise has basically created a government payments platform that has flexible payment options built in for constituents. Uh, and allows them many, many different ways uh, to pay off these types of debts or fees or whatever it may be in a way that is, uh, I would say, decent, um, like from a human level. Um, and again, what an innovation. You know, you just need to design the platform to be a little bit more flexible for folks. Uh, but they're seeing really, really good uh, results, and they just raise a whole bunch of money, and they're doing great. Um, so definitely not like your typical justice tech investment, but I think it is solving a you know significant problem for a lot of folks um, and preventing uh, our incarceration state from putting everyone in jail. That's great. Thank you, Greg. I wonder, I'm going to, I think we're going to go to you next, Chris uh, from Edovo, but before we do, I just want to call out a, a uh, comment in the chat. I'll just read it out. I guess people can read it as well from uh, Noah. Thank you for that. But he says, uh, and I'll read it out loud to give uh, my colleagues here a chance to think about it because um, it might be interesting if we, if it's relevant, we can touch on it in our pieces here. But he's saying, I agree with the panelists about the need for policy change in conjunction with disruptive technologies to address many of the problems justice tech companies look to address. Do you have any thoughts for how companies can work with nonprofits to address policy goals as well? Uh, I think that's a very interesting one, how company can, companies can be tightly aligned with nonprofits that have common overlapping goals. Um, and I think in there, he's listed his uh, company, and I think that would be interesting for people to take a look at uh, at some point. Yes. Chris, Novo, and we can think about that. That's a very interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. And nice to see you on here, Noah. Um, and and uh, Noah's actually uh, attacking uh, the, the same problem that Adobo was working on attacking as well, uh, which is um, education uh, uh, for individuals while they're incarcerated and under supervision. So um, I'll talk a little bit about Adobo uh, first, but Adobo uses tablet-based technology to, to allow self-directed educational programming um, in prisons and jails. Uh, and, you know, it's a sort of wide range of academic, vocational, and treatment programming um, is, is based on the idea that, you know, there are studies that basically show a, a dollar investment in educational programming results in 
five dollar reduction in incarceration costs, right? That's the very that's the very sort of dollar for dollar public cost that comes out of there. But the reason for that is that inmates that participate in you know correctional education programs actually see forty three percent lower odds of recidivism uh, than inmates that did not. And that's actually you know a study that's corrected for all the sorts of uh, uh, outside variables that may encourage somebody to participate or not participate in educational programming. So it's, it's, um, it, it's a really important study and it's really important to the work that, that, that Noah is doing in this space as well. Um, Adovo uh, uh, has over um, 150,000 learners that have completed over a million hours of, of educational uh, programming on the platform uh, and 75% of individuals that have had access to the program use it uh, on an average of, uh, of, of two lessons completed per day, right? So it's, it's very well used. Uh, of about 150 facilities, you know, are now using the product in, in one way or another. Um, and so it's a really uh, interesting approach. Uh, along the way, you know, similar uh to promise, it's not sort of as much of a change in in product. The end product is still maintained uh, the same, but the way they've gone to market has sort of evolved quite significantly over time. And a lot of it, you know, is really based on you know the navigation of some of the other private sector groups that are involved in this space and some of the other uh, issues that exist in this space. And so, all that to say that that that. Um, uh, all of this work requires some, you know, some tricky impact risk navigation in all, I think, all of these companies. And I think that's why it's important that I think you'll, you'll note that I think in all the cases that we describe here, um, uh, and, and being involved early and, and as investors and, and, and having some level of, of uh, board participation, you know, and in, in, in participation in the sort of strategy of these companies that they move forward is pretty pretty important. Uh, and I think that's where we can serve um, a really important role, particularly as other sort of uh, larger investors move into this space. I think having having folks that are involved that understand the space is, is pretty important as well. Great. I'll jump into Pigeonly quickly so you have time, Eric. Um, Pigeonly, uh, and you'll see this if you if you read the report, is really noted as kind of being the, the kickoff or starting point, if you will, for Justice Tech with the Kapoor investment in like 2012, 2013, somewhere in that space. Um, AmFam, uh, actually Pigeonly was our first investment in this space. Um, when we launched in 2018, Frederick Hudson, the founder, was actually the inaugural speaker at our institute. Um, we hosted a gathering in our space here in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was actually in talking to him and hearing his story that we actually were all like, we need to learn more about what he's doing and, and, and the impact that he's making. Um, and if you know Frederick's story, just a very high level, um, it was during his incarceration that he realized the people that he was seeing return were individuals that were not as connected to their families, that were not getting the phone calls, were not getting the letters. And so he started to ideate on this idea of Pigeonly, this platform that would um, provide a cost-effective way, a cost-effective communication platform for families to stay connected to their loved ones. Um, if any of you have ever had um, someone that's been incarcerated and have um, received those Phone calls, they're quite expensive. Um, um, if, you, if you research it, it ranges anywhere from $15 to $25, uh, depending on the call, one phone call. And so if you think about, you know, this whole idea of criminalizing the poor, continuing to make it difficult for them to advance, you're now making a decision on, do I talk to my loved one? or not based off of your economic situation. And so Frederick saw that and created this incredible tool that um, bypasses that and makes it more economical. Um, he also provides a way for families to stay connected through mail. And I think through our conversations that we've, we've been having here, the innovation is that he's also looking to see, understand policy and understand how he can scale and grow based off of, you know, that long game we've talked about and, and, just that was what we were impressed with um, because we joined at one stage, but he definitely had a clear vision about what Pigeonly would be. 
And so to Chris's comment about being, you know, engaged and uh, connecting with founders and understanding where they, uh, what their goals are and how they interact with the system. I've been just very fortunate to be an observer on the board and be connected with, with Fred um, as a friend. And so I just think it's another one of those platforms when we were looking at it, we were looking for ways to reduce recidivism and we weren't necessarily thinking about the system itself, but more how to help families. And so this was one that definitely jumped out for us. And I think I'm handing it to you, Eric. You are, but I got to give a quick shout out from the chat here. It says, I'm a big fan of Frederick and Pigeon Lee, double exclamation point. Thank you for sharing the other businesses too. So well done. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, we've got four minutes left. I'll go very quickly so I can hand back to Chris for the final wrap up. Um, yeah. And there's another nice chat for you. Uh, so uh, Reconnect is a company that we invested in about a year ago. Their main focus is, if you think about it, there are people who have been released from jail, pretrial, specialty court, parole, and there's other functions that are similar that all, and it's done at the local, state, and federal level. And the key denominator, the common denominator across all of this is there are conditions associated with your release. You need to see your parole or probation or specialty court officer at a certain period of time. You need to do various things. You may have curfew checks. You may have courses or classes you need to take, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. And on average, each of these participants, if you will use that word, have something like 18 things they're meant to do every day. Now, I don't know about anybody out there, but without this, I can't do more than one thing a day. So <laughs> the, in the technology platform that exists uh, for most people to deal with all of this is paper-based, rudimentary, maybe phone. So the entire idea of Reconnect is to take all of those administrative burdens and put it onto a modern technology platform that allows both the participants and this case managers to simply check in, remind, let you know you have an appointment, allow you to send a text, I'm running late, allow you to actually do check-ins that in the past pre-COVID would have to be done in person physically in somebody's office to then be handled perhaps through a video chat, perhaps there's simply a geotagged picture that you have attended your AA class, or you did do this, or you didn't go there, and, and so on and so forth. You have checked in at your curfew time. And if you think about it, I, and this is nicely outlined in the, re in the report, um, I'll show it again because I like doing that. Uh, but there's, you know, one of the facts is something like 40% of the people who end up going back are because of technical violations. And what I've just described are technical violations. And so the objective of this company is really to try and take a lot of that inefficiency and friction loss out of the system and do it in a humane way that increases people's likelihood of actually succeeding and allows case managers to focus on areas where they can help people versus simply the administrative burden of saying, did you do it? So that's Reconnect in a nutshell. And with just about a minute left, Chris, sorry, I didn't leave you much. I'll uh, hand back to you. No, that's great. Uh, and, and not much. I think we actually got through the uh, entire program with a minute to spare, which is great. Um, uh, I will quickly touch on um, Noah's, Noah's question as well. I, I do think you know, the impact space as a whole uh, creates lots of opportunities for, you know, private sector companies to interface with uh, nonprofits. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I think uh, one one sort of helpful piece that reduces risk in this type of investing, which, of course, is is always, you know, can be can be fairly risky from a financial standpoint, is the fact that many of the companies in the impact space have access to non-dilutive capital and, and grants and and uh, other nonprofit dollars, and so, um, so I think it is important for uh, for for companies where possible to interface, you know, with with nonprofits that are doing similar work, and also learn from them because because you know the, it's the nonprofits doing hard work in this space that really can reveal a lot of the what works and what doesn't work in the space, and I think that's really important to to, to understand and, and remain connected with those organizations. And I'm just trying to throw into the chat some of the links. So I got reconnect in Pigeonly, and I will try and find quickly Dovo and Promise. But uh, people can check it out, and their websites are great. 
And I'll just throw one more plug that if people are interested in learning more about our investor convening and the next the next two convenings and our collaborative, please reach out and we'll be happy to bring you on board to those conversations. Excellent. Thanks so much, everybody, for uh, attending. I guess with that, we can sign off. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Have a good one.